Hello everyone, and welcome to the 73rd episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring all of the evil elements we're presented with in The Batman. This film has proved itself to be a worthy addition to the Batman franchise, and though like many films, it isn't without its faults, the story it tells is intricately woven with many layers of evil that delivers a harrowing reminder of one of the most tragic truths of the human condition. Evil is everywhere. In this video, we're going to explore that message and all its implications as we delve into the dark underbelly of Gotham City, a world where crime and corruption run rampant, a world where the people living in it suffer the cruel stabs of injustice on a daily basis, a world where villains and monsters are created by the evil that emanates from nearly every institution in this city. Be warned though, as of the making of this video, this film is still in theaters, and there are many spoilers present in this video for those who haven't seen it. But before we begin, let's talk about our sponsor for this video, a product that's worthy of a socialite like Bruce Wayne, Scentbird. If you're tired of a cabinet full of half-used perfume and cologne bottles, Scentbird offers you a unique solution to that problem. Scentbird is a subscription service offering a monthly shipment of different sample sizes of perfumes and colognes from over 600 brands. They offer products from the top well-known brands like Gucci, Versace, and Prada, as well as scents from indie brands like Vince Camuto, The Harmonist, and Confessions of a Rebel, an enormous selection that allows you to choose fragrances that are specific to your needs. Their fragrances come in the form of 30-day supply sample vials that are eight times larger than the ones you can find in a department store, and they're set in these stylish, easy-to-use, and compact metal cases. Scentbird was kind enough to send me samples of Dirty Hinoki by Heretic, as well as Milk Plus and Wool by Commodity, and they're all great scents, but I definitely have to say that Dirty Hinoki is my favorite of the three, and you can see if it's right for you by going to scentbird.com slash vial and using the code vial at checkout to enjoy your first month of Scentbird for only $7, which is a total of 55% off the already incredible price of $15.95. Step your scent game up today with Scentbird by clicking the link in the description, and don't forget to use the code VIAL when you check out. Thank you Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's explore the suffocating umbra that is Gotham City. To start, we first need to examine the circumstances that led to the events of this film forming, those being the establishment of the Renewal Fund by Thomas Wayne and his death shortly after its implementation. Thomas Wayne, a doctor, a philanthropist, and would-be mayor, was a man with great compassion, one who sought to lift the less fortunate denizens of Gotham City out of the quagmire they'd been slowly sinking into over the course of its history. To do this, he created the Renewal Fund, a non-profit, charitable organization that was dedicated to restoring the crumbling public institutions of Gotham City, hospitals, schools, parks, community centers, homeless shelters, and orphanages would be built, rebuilt, and renovated so the hungry, the destitute, and the abandoned would no longer have to live in a world of severe poverty, malnutrition, and lackluster housing. However, Thomas made a grave mistake that cost him his life. Contracting a man he had once saved from a life-threatening injury to intimidate a journalist by the name of Thomas Elliot, a man who had gotten hold of information about his wife's crimes, as well as her mental conditions, information that could have seriously hurt his family if it were to become public knowledge. Unfortunately for Thomas, the man he contracted was Carmine Falcone, a ranking member and future boss of the Gotham City mob. Carmine, of course, took his intimidation too far and ended up killing Thomas Elliot, an act of murder that Thomas Wayne felt tremendously guilty over. Upon hearing the news, Thomas threatened to turn himself and Carmine in, after which Carmine decided to have Thomas murdered in order to protect himself, which along with the renewal fund, or more appropriately, the promise of it, sealed the fate of the many underprivileged souls in Gotham City. After Thomas Wayne's death, Carmine Falcone hatched a grand scheme, one that would see the former boss of the Gotham City mob, Sal Maroney, placed behind bars while he became the new boss of the criminal underworld, and in the process, obtaining all the corrupt politicians and policemen on Maroney's payroll for his own. And after his ascension, he turned the renewal fund into a money laundering scheme, a scheme that the elite of the city could easily wash their money through without anyone suspecting a thing. For 20 years after the death of Thomas Wayne, Gotham would fall more and more to darkness. The streets would become infested with criminals. The power apparatuses of the city filled with the corrupt cronies of Carmine Falcone, and the citizens would know fear and despair, unlike any they had experienced before. Which brings us to Edward Nashton, the future Riddler. As I mentioned earlier, Project Renewal was created to repair the crumbling public institutions of Gotham, orphanages among them. Edward Nashton was a child that was placed in one such orphanage, a critically neglected and underfunded one that was suffering structural decay, pest infestation, a lack of food, and a lack of space to house its occupants. 
Judging by his many scenes in the film, it would seem that Edward suffers from some sort of mental illness, which is likely some form of antisocial personality disorder. But considering the abuse he suffered and watched others endure in his childhood, it stands to reason that he developed whatever disorder he may have as a result of the trauma he experienced during his childhood. And all this trauma and abuse can be traced back to the abuse of the renewal fund. Had this fund actually been used properly, in all likelihood, Edward Nashton would have never had to experience the horrors he did, and the Riddler would have never been born. But it was abused, and Edward discovered this one fateful day when he was working his job as a forensic accountant, a discovery that would lead him on a mad hunt to uncover all the conspirators involved in this plot to bleed Gotham dry, a plot that was responsible for all the mistreatment he suffered as a child. As we come to find out during the events of this film, this plot runs incredibly deep, as it's not just a few government officials taking bribes here and there. It's almost the entirety of the Gotham government that's under the thumb of Carmine Falcone. The mayor, the police commissioner, the district attorney, and hundreds of cops, all working towards lining their own pockets and the pockets of the elite at the expense of everyone else in the city, not to mention the career criminals who already work for Falcone, like the Penguin. Every kind of criminal enterprise you can imagine is being left to run rampant in this city, with only false attempts at stopping them made to save face for those in power. As I'm sure a countless amount of criminals apprehended by the police during this time period were eventually sprung from jail, or prison, by the grace of their friends in power. So upon discovering this, Edward, an incredibly damaged individual, decides to do something about it, and that something comes in the form of vengeance rained down upon those responsible for the hardship he's been forced to experience due to their machinations. And he proceeds to enact an elaborate plan in which the mayor, the police commissioner, the DA, and Carmine Falcone would all perish. And as an integral part to this plan is Batman. I've mulled over the idea of making a video centered around vigilantism for a while now, and I still might in the future. But this film gives us the perfect opportunity to examine the positive and negative aspects of vigilantism. The positive comes in the form of what Batman does and how he does it. Batman is essentially the perfect vigilante. He's a man serving as an extension of law enforcement who seeks criminals out to put under citizens' arrest, after which he hands them over to the proper authorities so justice can be meted out as it was intended to be. Batman tries his best not to harm anyone outside of self-defense or the defense of others, and his number one rule is to never kill anyone while he's attempting to apprehend criminals. This is all well and good, but the reason that you often see so many people in these films commenting on Batman's role as a vigilante and how harmful it is, is because of how much potential there is for a vigilante to do far more harm than good, whether that's directly through their actions or by influencing others. In this case, Batman influences others to engage in this behavior, and that results in undisciplined people without any sort of training to take justice into their own hands, which has enormous potential for human error to occur. There's a reason that law enforcement are required to go through training, and while those institutions and the people that they're comprised of aren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, it's overall much safer for a trained professional to handle any kind of situation than an untrained one. And that notion is still true when you apply it to fighting crime and we're given a great example of this with the actions that Edward takes in this film. Now the mayor, the police commissioner, the DA, and Carmine Falcone all deserve to be punished for their crimes. Carmine Falcone deserved either life in prison or the death penalty for the murders he committed or ordered to be committed. However, the mayor, the commissioner, and the attorney are a different story. All three may very well deserve life in prison or the death penalty when you consider the severity of their actions, as who knows how many people suffered or died due to the policies implemented by the mayor or the improper application of justice taken by the commissioner and the DA. And in a world filled with injustice, it's very possible that these men wouldn't receive the punishment they truly deserve. In all four cases though, Edward has eliminated two key things that are incredibly important when dealing with criminal cases like this. The first of course being the right to a fair trial, where one is innocent until proven guilty and the second is the ability to potentially uncover the vast number of corrupted officials who worked for these men by squeezing information from them, which would prove to be infinitely more valuable than their immediate deaths would. But the right to a fair trial is arguably more important here, as the lack of it when fighting crime yourself serves as one of the biggest downsides to vigilantism. There's a system in place in the United States that, again, isn't perfect, but if the citizens of any country are selective with how we implement our laws, they don't really mean all too much. What does it matter if everyone is supposedly guaranteed the right to a fair trial if we allow people to take justice into their own hands and provide exemptions to this rule of their own volition? Again, there are times when vigilantism can prove to be an effective way to handle certain criminals who would go unpunished otherwise, but those instances are the exception 
not the rule. And on the whole, the widespread use and glorification of this practice would inevitably further break down a system of justice that already has many flaws. And as we see in this film, sometimes when people decide to take matters into their own hands, it can lead to horrible actions that they perceive as being done for the greater good, or for revenge, which is what the Riddler does in this film especially at the climax. Not only did he plan to take out the people who he believed deserved to be punished, but he planned to flood the entire city by blowing up the seawalls, which already would have caused many deaths in the ensuing chaos for various reasons. But he also cultivated a following online and had the members of his veritable cult of vengeance planted in shelters so they could murder the survivors, all because Edward and his followers feel stepped on by society and want to cause as much harm as they possibly can purely to satisfy themselves. So with all these different avenues of evil presented to us, there are several lessons that this film is attempting to impart upon us. First, is that one act of evil can spread further evil like wildfire. In this case, that act is Thomas Wayne's willingness to contract a thug to silence a journalist. Because of this one act, he courted his own death at the hands of Carmine Falcone, setting off a domino effect that ensured Thomas's renewal fund and Gotham City would be overran by corruption that ensnared everyone from police officers to the highest officials of the Gotham government. Second is the fact that due to this overwhelming corruption, an untold amount of suffering ensued as a direct result of severe embezzlement and negligence on the part of politicians and law enforcement, which resulted in the creation of the Riddler and his cohorts. This allows us to see a great example of just how the misuse of power can drastically alter the life of an individual so severely that they themselves turn into an extension of that corruption. A corrupt soul, irrevocably damaged by the mistreatment they suffer at the hands of those who swore to serve and protect them. The third lesson is the consequences of vigilantism, which are readily apparent when Edward states that his plans were inspired by the actions of Batman, showing us that good intentions aren't always enough and that perceived virtuous actions can have horrible repercussions. And the fourth and final lesson is that vengeance is almost never the answer. Just like vigilantism, seeking vengeance often results in severe consequences for not only the person, people, or institutions that are the target of your vengeance, but people adjacent to your actions. It's okay to be angry, it's okay to feel hurt, but as Bruce points out in this film when he's speaking to Selina about murder, if you kill the people you're after, you're no better than they are. The same logic can be applied to vengeance, as the pursuit of it can result in a person becoming a dark cesspool of who they once were, a being who's focused solely on the darkness inflicted upon them and their attempts to remedy that darkness by reflecting it back upon the ones who harmed them. As Bruce realizes at the end of the film, justice and retribution should be the end result of one's good intentions to change the world for the better, not by one's efforts to sow more violence in an already violent world. I'm not in the habit of preaching, but seeing as there are many similarities that we can draw between Edward's actions and some of the real-world tragedies we see occur often, I wanted to take this moment to say to anyone out there who might feel ostracized from or abused by society that violence is never the answer. And if you've ever had thoughts about suicide or harming others, I implore you to please seek help. And I'll link several useful resources in the description for you to utilize if that's the case. This film had a central antagonist, Edward Nashton, the Riddler, but Edward was created by nearly every evil act perpetrated by the characters in this story, from Thomas Wayne ordering a journalist to be roughed up, all the way to Carmine Falcone corrupting all of Gotham City. And it's for that reason that I felt this film deserved to be examined as a whole, and to focus solely on Edward would have been wrong, as there would be no Riddler if it weren't for the actions of devious men and women who created an environment riddled with evil. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on this film? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.